And I remember that the first stand-up I did, my, my leg was shaking so much that I couldn't, I couldn't control it. My leg was like my whole thing. It was just a standing in a field. And then the um, first live shot I ever did as a correspondent, I managed to say on camera, oh, f Martin Fletcher, NBC News in Tehran. That was my first ever live shot. <laughs> Hi, I'm Martin Fletcher. I'm a retired NBC News foreign correspondent and bureau chief in the Middle East. Welcome to NBCU Academy. When you say the word foreign correspondent, it literally still sends a shiver down my spine. Those two words, foreign correspondent, I find exciting, glamorous, glorious, and I was, and I was one for decades. Martin Fletcher, NBC News, the Vatican. Tripoli, Kabul, Skopje, Dese, Ethiopia. But when I left university, I joined the BBC as a writer but I was bored out of my mind at the BBC desk in London, so I want to go somewhere. So I taught myself camera work, joined an agency, Viz News, Reuters TV, as a cameraman for five years in Africa. I was living in Zimbabwe, then NBC hired me as a cameraman. And then I found myself in one situation that nobody wanted to go, and I was reporting. And then they said, oh, well, keep doing it. <laughs> so Rhodesia now has its internal settlement. What now counts is whether the rest of the world, in particular America and Britain, will go along with it. We were on our own. I mean, and, and it's better that way. Our man Martin Fletcher managed to join a band of Afghan guerrillas in the city of Peshawar in Pakistan and to go with them into Afghanistan. When NBC asked me when the Russians invaded Afghanistan, would I go in with the Mujahideen from Pakistan? So I walked across the Hindu Kush mountains for three weeks with a band of Mujahideen. And it was just me with my little camera not speaking a word, I had a translator and that was it. The weather was terrible. They knew I was Jewish, they were trying to convert me to Islam every night. It was exhausting and difficult and hard and extremely dangerous, but it was also the most extraordinary challenge. Their weapons are few machine guns, mainly single shot rifles. These seemed no match for Soviet hardware, but the Afghans were confident. Understanding how to operate in difficult circumstances is key. You know, there's no water, there's no food, there's no transport, the planes you know, no, there's no train, there's nothing. You know, you know where the next transport is, they run out of gas. Some people just freak out. I just sort of get up and start walking. I think it makes them feel safe. I think it makes them feel that there's a presence here. You're nothing without your sources. So most of my work was in the field, meeting people, and they became my sources. Civil war and hunger. On the Horn of Africa, the two go hand in hand. Now it's all too sadly true in Somalia. <laughs> NBC News said to me, will you go to Somalia to report on the civil war and the famine? And at the time, that was a place of complete anarchy. There was no government, there was no police, there was no army, there was no currency, there was no immigration at the airport, you just landed the plane, you know. We flew in on a plane from Kenya, sitting on a pile of cut, which is drugs. You know, there was like no rules. It was just like, will you do it? Yeah, that, yeah, we'll go. But the way to stay safe in Mogadishu then, given there were five warlords all fighting each other in an area of about four square miles, was to get in with the strongest warlord. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So we got to know Farah and Mohammed Adid. Now again, Somalia, where a dozen U.S. forces were killed today and more American troops are en route tonight. Remember Black Hawk Down? When his guys killed the American Special Forces, I was the only guy to find him to interview him after, me and my team. They couldn't locate the elusive warlord, but NBC's Martin Fletcher did. Would you surrender? Um, for what reason I have to surrender? I'm not guilty. I'm skeptical of everybody. I don't believe anything anybody tells me at any level. Not because I, I disbelieve them, but they're all trying to tell me something. You have to be listen very skeptically. You know, they're not really telling you what they feel right away. They're not necessarily they're holding something back. And I, I want to know how they really feel. You know, I don't want to put people on the spot. I don't want to make life difficult for them, but I want to find out what happened and who did it and why. You've got to know what's going on in many places, so you've got to be curious. You've got to follow the news all the time so that if you suddenly end up in Tiananmen Square after a massacre in China, as I did, knowing nothing about China whatsoever, and they said 20 minutes later after I arrived in the bureau, oh, you're on live in 10 minutes. I don't even know the name of the prime minister. The Communist Party has chosen a new leader after weeks of confusion, and the choice was a big surprise. The most important contact you make 
in a difficult situation is basically the cab driver you meet at the airport. And you're looking for a driver so to drive me for the next week or two. You know? So the, the choice of driver, funnily enough, is critical in A, staying alive, and B, making contact in the street. Basically, you're putting your lives in the hands of people, or very often, literally. So that people judgment is critical for journalists, for foreign correspondents. Judging people is number one in terms of staying safe. And being lucky. I mean, it's just luck in the end. You know, I've had, I've got lots of friends. I mean, a dozen close friends who've been killed as foreign correspondents, at least a dozen, let alone wounded. And luck is the most important factor. With the death toll mounting, the call everywhere here on the West Bank is to protect the Palestinian refugee camps and for revenge. Well, of course it's dangerous. I'm a foreign correspondent covering a war. What do you think? So wherever there is a, a major conflict, that's where we go. So you will find yourself in Ukraine, in Gaza, in, in all kinds of different difficult circumstances. Freezing cold, not enough food, dangerous stuff, bombs falling. That will happen to you. If you're calm and relaxed and you can assess danger honestly, then you can do that kind of a job. So let's see what this feels like. There you go. <laughs> oh man. You get to meet the most remarkable people in the most remarkable moments of their lives all the time. Every day you go somewhere and you meet somebody going through some extraordinary challenge and you see them beginning to overcome it. That transitional moment from tragedy to carrying on with life. That's what life is about.